Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our briefing this afternoon. My name is Carol Werner. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. And we are delighted that you are all here this afternoon uh, for this important discussion. Uh, and, and it is an, it's always a pleasure to be working with Jim Hecker, who is the General Counsel of WIRES and a former Chairman of FERC. And this briefing is another part of a whole series that we are doing this year that is looking at how we can build a more resilient and secure infrastructure. And certainly, your being part of this important WIRES University is a critical, critical element in that, which hopefully is going to help us all learn more, know how to ask better questions, and help us all to do our job in a in a more informed and better way. So we are delighted to be able to sponsor this briefing with WIRES, the House Grid Innovation Caucus, the National Electric Manufacturers Association. So now I'm going to turn our discussion over to Jim Hecker, who will introduce our um, members of the Congress who are, we're delighted that they are with us today so that we can kick off our briefing and also get them to their vote on time. Jim. Thank you, Carol. Uh, I know the congressmen have a vote coming up in about 10 minutes, so uh, uh, thank you all for coming. I think, I think you're going to enjoy this. We've, we've, we've tried to, uh, to add some meaning to the big I word that's around town, which is infrastructure. And one of those critical infrastructures, perhaps in some ways the most critical, is transmission. And uh, uh, the two congressmen joining us today uh, as co-chairs of the Grid Innovation Caucus uh, also believe in intelligent transmission, smart, smart transmission, and um, deploying the best technology for the, for the future. Uh, let me introduce them briefly um, and, uh, and, and let them uh, let them uh, tell you more about it. But um, Congressman Jerry McNerney uh, represents the 9th District in California, which uh, includes a, a big section of the San Joaquin uh, County and uh, Central Valley. Uh, he's he's uh, appeared at other and, and spoken to other WIRES university meetings, for which we are deeply grateful. Uh, he, of course, is on the uh, House Committee on Energy and Commerce uh, and uh, and uh, as a background, uh, as a scientist, uh, he's also on the Veterans Affairs Committee, and um, uh, we we appreciate his being here. Uh, the the newest co-chair is uh, Representative Bob Latta from Ohio. Um, he represents Ohio's fifth, uh, and uh, uh, is uh, also I think a member of the Energy and Power Subcommittee of the uh, of the uh, Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, both of them have uh, great interest in the subject matter, and I very much appreciate them being here. So I'll turn it over to you, gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, well, good afternoon. Uh, it's a really pleasure to be here. It's an issue I feel a lot of passion about. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my background. Um, I spent uh, about 25 years. Uh, developing wind energy technology and, and projects. Um, part of that, I also developed a smart meter uh, for residential use uh, at EPRI. So I've uh, been in the industry for many years. Uh, it's an industry I, I sort of uh, developed a passion for in college when the, uh, o uh, when the uh, oil embargo hit us in the 70s. And uh, energy has always seemed like a, a great field. Um, there's a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of money. Uh, and uh, it's, just, it's just a very exciting place to be. Um, the caucus, uh, the Grid Innovation Caucus in the House, was started two years ago by uh, my uh, Republican colleague uh, Renee Elmers, and uh, we accomplished a few things, uh, and including the uh, Strategic Transformer Reserve uh, in the um, uh, in, in the uh, Fast Act, uh, which establishes transformers uh, or will establish transformers uh, for for use in emergency situations. Um, Bob Latta joined me as a co-chair this year, and I'm really glad to have Bob along board. I'll say a little bit more later, but Bob is a friend of mine, and he's someone I actually work with, um, and that's maybe a rarity, maybe not, but it's good to know that there's some bipartisan potential uh, in, the, uh, in Washington. Now, 
Uh, the caucus was formed uh, because it's an underappreciated um, issue. The, the transmission is a very underappreciated issue. We have, uh, um, a, 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 it's one of our critical pieces of infrastructure. Uh, the United States has developed a, a tremendous uh, manufacturing and, and all these uh, capabilities we have a large part due to our, our transmission uh, of electric power. Uh, we also have, uh, so the point is that we want to, we want to um, sort of educate our colleagues about this issue. We're talking about uh, investing in infrastructure here in Washington, and I think we want to make sure that this is front and center. People know how important this is and the uh, return on investment that they'll get uh, for the investment that's made in transmission. We also have uh, cyber and physical security to consider, um, and we have, again, our own, uh, what, what, what is Congress going to do? Are we, what are we going to do to uh, invest? What are we going to do to uh, um, make investments seem like a, a good idea for, for the private sector? So um, the challenges we have, of course, are the natural gas and transmission uh, nexus, as we see uh, Generating power depends on natural gas more and more. We have situations where we could have shortages of natural gas, uh, and that would affect our transmission, it would affect our generation. So uh, that's one of our, our big challenges. Uh, we have renewables, which uh, bring a whole other set of challenges in terms of intermittency. How can we provide uh, renewables from uh, the great renewable resource areas of our country? For example, uh, the Dakotas have a tremendous, tremendous wind resource. Uh, how do we get, uh, if we put in windmills, how do we get that power to the load centers across the country? Um, the different states have their uh, renewable portfolio standards, which put, again, another set of constraints uh, and other uh, challenges to our, our national grid. How do we model this? Uh, are there going to be sufficient um, computer models and mathematical models to, uh, to be able to tell us how to operate and how to run this and how to invest our money? Um, there's also uh, security, there's congestion on our lines, there's distributed generation, and there's uh, the sort of challenge of a flat load growth. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not growing because certain sections of the country have uh, a growing load and some sections are, are, are diminishing their load. So uh, these are all big challenges that transmission is facing over the next uh, decade, and uh, it's time that we have organizations like WIRES that understand these uh, um, draw investors into the right areas, uh, communicate with their members of Congress and senators uh, the importance of these issues. So uh, we have a lot on our plate, and it's, it's great to have those. Of course, the opportunity out, is out there with, with technology. Uh, we see all kinds of technology taking place. We see storage. We see uh, fast switching uh, and uh, all the modeling technology out there. So we have a real a set of real big challenges, and we have the technology that can meet those challenges. So it's an exciting time to be in the business. Um, there's a lot of state dynamics going on. As I mentioned, different states have different uh, uh, renewable portfolio standards. We have the different PUCs. Uh, we have the ISOs out there that are, uh, that are in control of the local area uh, distribution. And we have different states trying different experiments in terms of, uh, of these challenges. So uh, it's a great time. Um, and I would just want to say about transmission. Transmission, uh, even though we have distributed generation uh, and, and all this other stuff, the, the transmission is really the backbone of our national electrical system. Um, we have to, again, we have to figure out how to get power from where it's produced to where it's needed. Uh, we have to be able to provide when there's uh, shortages or outages in some parts of the country. So uh, transmission is really going to form the background without uh, a good, solid, a reliable, uh, effective transmission system, uh, we're going to see a, a lot of problems, and, and so uh, that's uh, that's our that's our that's our challenge, and, and that's why Wires is here, I I believe. So uh, we want to make sure we have the right congressional uh, approach to these problems, uh, and our our good caucus, our good innovation caucus, is going to help us get there. Now, uh, I have the honor of uh, introducing my good friend Bob Latta. I just want to say one thing. Bob has spent 27 years in public service, starting in the, in the county commission. So that's a, a man that has really dedicated himself to uh, our needs. Uh, and uh, I really appreciate that in, in anybody, because public service is a challenge. Thanks, Thank you. Jerry. Thanks, Bob. Thanks very much. Well, thanks very much, and, and to my good friend. Uh, you know, it is true. You, you, uh, 
You can find a lot of things you can work together on here, and uh, this is one of those very important issues that we have to make sure that as we go forward as a nation, this is something that's at the top of the list. And as Jerry pointed out a little bit, uh, talking about uh, kind of his background and also his, uh, where he's from, I'm from Northwest West Central Ohio. And let me give you a little bit of an idea what my district looks like. I have 60,000 manufacturing jobs in my district. In those manufacturing jobs, I have the largest food processing plant in the world in my district. I had the largest pre-manufactured furniture man manufacturer in my district. I have central foundry from General Motors. I have float glass. I have steel mill. I have uh, steel coating. And then you go down right down the line to everybody else that's out there that needs uh, reliable electricity. I have, far I have the largest farm income producing district in the state of Ohio. What's that mean? Well, I've got a lot of folks out there that have livestock. Well, in the middle of the winter, the last thing you want to do is have uh, unreliable uh, power going out to your barns because, again, your livelihood counts on it. So it's, when you start looking around our, all of our districts, we can all find things we have something uh, unique, but we all have one thing we, we always know that we have, we all need electricity. And it's not that we need less, we need more, and we need it to be reliable. And so when you're talking about the grid, it's so important that we have that. Uh, it, it, when we we're talking about things like that, especially in the private sector, again, we're, the innovation that's going on out there is tremendous. And if I could just touch on a little bit of that in a little bit, I think it's important. The other things, especially that uh, Jerry and I see being on energy and commerce, we talk about a lot of things. Cyber attacks. What, what do we have to do to make sure that our, uh, our system out there is protected, that we make sure that it can be delivered? So that, that's also very, very important on the security aspects and how vulnerable it is because, again, you know, in our country we have lines running everywhere and it's important that we have those lines uh, operating all the time. Uh, yesterday uh, we had uh, a, uh, a hearing in energy and commerce in the, in the uh, uh, energy subcommittee and one of the witnesses I, I posed this question to because uh, for some of you might not remember this but we had a, a huge power outage that occurred in 2003 from Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, up into Ontario and it was very, I can say, you know I can remember that like it was yesterday because the reason I can remember it my wife said, you know, maybe we should take a short family vacation that weekend. And guess where we went? Well, to Ontario. <laughs> and so we followed everything all the way through. That There was no power. I thought, you know, when we get up to Toronto, we could be in trouble when we get there that we won't have any lights. But the one thing I posed to one of our witnesses yesterday, especially when you're talking about smart grid, smart, smart technology, how could that be avoided or how could that have been corrected quicker than the time it took to get everybody up at that time? So, you know, the technology that we have today is, is so important and that's one of the things that as we look at things in committee is making sure that we can advance this and uh, I know that Jerry uh, attended quite of our Internet of Things meetings that we had in the last uh, Congress. Uh, Peter Welch and I are the, uh, the co-chairs of that working group. But we just look at the Internet of Things and how the technology, especially on the energy sector, how important it is today and how that's moving things along, that's where we need to go. And that's one of the wonderful things about serving on the Energy and Commerce Committee is when you're sitting there, you're not looking at where you are today. You're not looking in a rearview mirror as where you've been. But you're seeing people come before us in committee talking about not where they are today, but where they're going to be in five years and ten years. And that's one of the things that's a challenge to us on the legislative side and also when you talk about on the regulatory side to make sure that we're not putting things, roadblocks up in front of people as they advance the technology they have to have to get forward. And that's one of the things when we had our working group last year on the Internet of Things is listening to the folks talking about what they need to have from us to make sure that they can go out and innovate to get that technology to you in the future and that future is coming much faster than you think so that's really really important because again like i said it's not in the rearview mirror we're talking five and ten years out and sometimes where we are in government that's where we're stuck is right where we're in the present but you look where the other everyone else is they've moved on and they're out there already in front of us uh jerry touched on a little bit uh, especially when we we're talking about you know getting this uh, power to folks is that you know I, i've adv advocated for years and all the above energy and, you know being from northwest ohio you know we have a uh, you talk about the complete mix because ohio until a few years ago is about 73 percent co-generated we've had the utica shale in ohio there's a marcellus in pennsylvania but now you're just looking at uh, natural gas uh, right it used to be in my old state senate district now it's just only a few miles out but it's the davis Bessie nuclear power station uh, we have hydro on the ohio river and then of course the renewables there's more wind turbines in my district than any place else in the state of ohio 
Now, if you come to my district, people say, what's it look like? Well, it's kind of like the top of that table right there. And it is green, too. Uh, but it's, it's pretty flat. And so when kids come to uh, the University of Bowling Green, where I'm from, they say, boy, this is the windiest place they, that they could ever be from. And that's why we have the wind turbines. But uh, we need that all of the above energy uh, policy to make sure that we can move it along. Just going back to talk about on the energy security, making sure that we don't have the outages because it's cost Americans average annually about $150 billion just because of outages. And so that's why Jerry and I are working on legislation to make sure that we don't have that. So people, when they get up in the morning and they go to, the, to turn on those machines every day, that those, everything is running. And, uh, you know, again, in my area with all of the manufacturing, you can't have plants shutting down because when you're talking about float glass or steel, that, that has to be a continuous flow of energy or you got a real problem if you have, to have, a, if you have an outage. So that's, that's what we're looking at, making sure that we don't have those things happen. Again, as I said yesterday, uh, when we're talking about wanting to make sure that we have a smarter grid, and so, again, that's why we have the hearings. That's where we want to advance this, especially in, in our caucus, to make sure that we're advancing these things forward because, uh, you know, we don't want to be stuck in the past. And uh, we want to make sure that the United States is on, the, on, on that cutting edge, making sure that we advance things forward, that we have it for the people that not only are here, but also you can encourage other people from around the world saying, you know what, the United States has a very secure grid. We can come here, we can manufacture, and they and bring more jobs to this country. So we need to, you know, as uh, Jerry had mentioned a little bit, we have to talk about building new transmission lines and looking at the business models for utilities on that new technology. So there, these, there's a lot of answers. Uh, these are the answers give us a lot of great place to start in, for, in the weeks ahead as we start going forward. But one of the things that I know that we both really want to hear from, we need to hear from everybody in this room. We need to hear from folks out there as to how can we do our job here in the House, even though we're in the Senate right now. But we have to really make sure we hear from you. So I, I, I always tell folks this, my door is always open. I need to hear from you because we don't want to miss anything. We want to make sure that what we're doing is the right thing. And sometimes, you know, uh, you might be in hearings and uh, through the years, you might go in there with this one thought thinking, you know what, this is the way we ought to do it. And you start hearing the testimony out there and you start thinking about different applications. And you say, you know what, maybe we ought to rethink this a little bit. But it all comes down to one thing. It's the delivery of that energy to the people of this country. So I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. I look forward to working with my good friend as we go forward. But again, if you ever have questions, please give us a call because we need to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. This is a, a great, uh, great favor you've done for us. Um, let me. Uh, let me give you a little background before and ask our panelists to come up. Uh, while they're doing that, um, uh, I'd like to uh, acknowledge that uh, their emphasis, uh, Congressman's emphasis on improved technology is, is very appropriate. Um, and uh, digital technology will carry us to the future. Now if we can just find somebody to fix that door. Okay, well, WIRES is an international nonprofit uh, trade association uh, made of a very diverse membership uh, of companies that promotes investment in transmission uh, and, uh, and uh, pertinent technologies that go with it. Um, we believe that, uh, that technology uh, will, uh, be, uh, will have a critical role, as the congressman said, uh, getting us to that more electrified, uh, more energized economy of 2035 and 2040. And um, uh, so uh, uh, we're going to be talking about wires today, but we're going to also be talking about what I'd call the grid of things. Uh, there are a lot of things that we're going to be hanging on those wires uh, to get the system more animated, more efficient uh, in the future. Um, and that's what wires does. We do a lot of a lot of talking, do a lot of studies, do a lot of helping uh, people to understand why this investment is critical. Uh, the National Electric Manufacturers Association that's also sponsoring this is a, is a tremendous uh, and, and much older uh, group and uh, we appreciate their support. EESI and Carol Werner, of course, uh, uh, everyone knows Carol on the Hill. So 
but I'd also like to mention the Gridwise Alliance, which is a, a group of technology companies uh, that the congressmen also support. Uh, and uh, uh, Ladine Freemuth would, would kill me if I forgot to mention that. So uh, uh, they are very much a part of, uh, of what, we're, what we're doing today. Um, we have, a, we have a, an exceptional panel. Uh, and uh, and we're going to begin with what I call Transmission 101. Uh, <clears throat> uh, our good friend from Smart Wires, uh, Andy McCoy, uh, is going to take some extra time to kind of walk us through, for those of you uh, who are not, uh, who don't live, eat, and breathe, and dream about at night, the, the grid, uh, she's going to tell us a little bit about what it is, how it operates, kind of the nuts and bolts, and uh, I, I would think you're going to want to, going to want to uh, uh, hang on her every word because this is, this is important. Uh, this is important stuff. If you can understand what the grid is and how integrated it is and how much it means to our standard of living, you're halfway there. Uh, the rest of our panels, uh, 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 Andy, by the way, is, a, is an engineer. She works for Smart Wires <coughs> and for, formerly Burns and Mac, Burns and McDonald in Kansas City. Um, and uh, uh, both those firms are, are, are exceptional. Um, we, uh, we, she will be followed uh, by some, uh, and I, I've urged them, I said, you know, you guys are the smartest guys in the room, but please keep it short. So we have uh, opportunity to ask questions. Uh, but uh, Claire Moeller uh, is from the Mid-Continent ISO. Uh, he is uh, uh, an executive leader of the office of the chief operating officer uh, and responsible for MISO's transmission planning functions and transmission services. Um, he has uh, uh, done so many things, and he is one of those gifted people who can talk in engineering and talk in policy, uh, and everybody sort of understands the connection. And, and so I, I'm, I'm delighted he's here. He's, um, he's a, a graduate of uh, Iowa State University in the Oxford Advanced Management and Leadership course. Uh, uh, and um, uh, it doesn't sound like he's from Oxford, but it, well, OK. Um, our, our, uh, our, uh, at the far end is, is Mike Ross. Uh, Mike, uh, many of you probably recognize because he was in Congress for 12 years. Uh, for 12 years and um, also I think a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, Mike is now uh, uh, a uh, uh, senior vice president uh, uh, in, uh, uh, for for government affairs and public relations uh, for the Southwest Power Pool, which is headquartered in Little Rock, Arkansas. But uh, from, uh, from Little Rock, great things expand, and uh, now the Southwest Power Pool is gathering under its operational wing uh, transmission systems going all the way to the Canadian border and possibly further west uh, almost to California. Uh, it's a it's a great story, and Mike is a uh, is a is a great person to tell it. Uh, and last um, is uh, Craig Glazer, who's the uh, VP of Federal Government Policy for the PJM interconnection in which we are situated today. Um, this is the I think the biggest electrical interconnection on the planet, is it not? In terms of uh, in terms of uh, megawatts. Um, or numbers of customers. Anyway, uh, uh, Craig is the former chairman of the Ohio Public uh, Utility Commission. Uh, he's been around this game for a long time and uh, a graduate of Penn and Vanderbilt Law School. Uh, he is uh, he's one of the smartest guys in the room. Uh, and um, because they're all smartest guys in the room, um, uh, I'm going to ask them to try and keep it simple and try to keep it short so that you have a chance to ask some questions about why transmission is important and why it's going to con investment in the grid is going to be continue to be important for years. So why don't we start with Andy McCoy and, 
and then uh, we will uh, we'll go on to the rest of our presenters. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to get a timer going real quick so that I can be respectful of everybody's time. Uh, happy to be here. As you mentioned, my name is Andy McCoy. Uh, I am electrical engineer by degree. And uh, today I'm going to step through some of the very basics of how electricity works, how the power grid works, how power moves around, uh, and hopefully peel back some of the layers. We had a great um, kind of overview from the representatives earlier. Um, I'm going to step it back. Before I do, I did want to make one point, though, um, while we're still at the higher level of, of thinking here. Um, I think it's very easy to think about the grid in terms of function and um, convenience. Uh, everybody wants to see their lights turn on when they flip the switch. Um, and I think it's easy to talk about how dependent we are becoming on electricity, again, from a functional standpoint. But I do think it's important to think of the economics of it. Uh, and how it keeps us as a nation competitive uh, in the international market. Um, it is, uh, I actually very recently, some of our international clients, uh, SmartWires international clients, were uh, in uh, California visiting us for some meetings. And with them came the development agency for their country. Uh, they were coming to Silicon Valley to try to court many of the uh, data centers or the tech companies there to have them bring their data centers to their country. Uh, one of the main considerations in citing where a data center might go is energy, and that's not uncommon. Same with manufacturing. The cost of energy is the number one O&M cost that, that those data centers have, and so finding places where they can find uh, clean and cheap energy is more and more important to these businesses as they make these business decisions. So anyways, I just wanted to highlight that. I think it is uh, you know, beyond function and, and convenience. There's certainly an economic tie that should be forefront on your mind. With that, um, is this the tip clicker? All right. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna breeze past a few slides because I, I recognize that the gentleman to my left uh, will be better to cover a few of these as they actually are grid operators and planners. So I'm going to breeze past some of that and instead try to focus on, again, the very high level. What is the grid? So in short, the grid is a network of wires and um, electrical devices that move power around from generation to load. Um, and we'll talk a little more about the components of the grid. But first, in terms of electricity, this is a very popular analogy. So thinking of electrons as water molecules rather than electrons. It's very hard. In fact, uh, my husband's a mechanical engineer. Uh, he has no idea why I would do electrical engineering because it's something you can't see. So that really bothers people sometimes. I can't see electricity, so it's hard to conceptualize it. If you put it into the water analogy, it works much better. So just some of the basic definitions of, that you'll hear in the industry, starting with voltage. So if you were to compare this to the water um, analogy, this would be like pressure. So if you have, let's say, a tank of water, a reservoir, and you have a pipe coming out of the bottom of it, the pressure that's coming out of the, the bottom of that pipe, how, how pressurized that uh, flow is, that would be like voltage. Then the actual measure of that flow, so number of molecules passing any point at any given moment, that's your current. So that's actually, as we talk more, I think current will be the, the, probably the definition that you're gonna hear me reference more often than not because as we talk about how the grid operates, we're talking about how electrons flow around on it and why that's important. Power then would be equivalent to um, the rate at which the electricity is being transferred. So this is in watts. And then the thing that you would see on your bill would be uh, you know, megawatt hours, kilowatt hours. That's actually energy. So that's the amount. So that's how you get charged is based on the amount of power or energy that you're using. So to further illustrate then, uh, a 115 watt light bulb used five hours per day for 30 days, if you multiply that out one by the next, uh, would be 2.25 kilowatt hours. So again, just to step through how, how you get that number on your bill, it's based on how many items you're turning on, what wattage those items require, and how long you're using them. So again, for scale, what can you power with one megawatt hour um, Here's just a few examples, all of these things listed here. So you could cool a refrigerator for three months. You could download 
over 130,000 songs. You can brew over 2,000 pots of coffee. You can power a traffic signal for three months, and you can charge over 5,000 phones. And then you can host 600 Super Bowl parties. So again, this is just a, a sense for scale here. Uh, what I would note here, though, is uh, you'll hear energy efficiency. People talk about energy efficient um, appliances. So when you're, when you're buying an energy efficient appliance, what you're doing is you're, you're finding something that's using less watts but provides the same output. So in the end, that lowers your bill. So components of the grid. Uh, the four base components that you'll hear people talk about are generation, Tra um, transmission, distribution, and load. So we'll quickly talk through each of those. Uh, generation, this is where the electricity is generated as, as indicated. So this traditionally was a lot of fossil fuel power plants. Um, more and more, when we talk about new technologies in the generation space, that's the, the wind turbines, the solar power, there's tidal, so using waves for energy, harnessing that energy out of, out of the ocean. Um, so a growing list now of, of technologies on the generation front. But in order to actually use that energy, you have to get it to where people are at. Where is it going to be used? So that's the load side, so the opposite end. So we as consumers, when we flip the, the light on, we are increasing the load when we turn that light on. But there's a lot of, a lot of stuff that has to happen on the in-between, uh, and that's where we, where we talk about uh, the importance of transmission. Um, Nobody wants to have a power plant in their backyard, so you're going to site those somewhere far away from your load centers, traditionally, um, or with solar or wind or these renewable resources. Um, they're dependent on the resource, so you're, uh, you don't have the flexibility of picking where it's going to go. You have to put wind where it's windy. You have to put solar where it's sunny, and so on and so forth. So in order to get the, the, trend, or the energy to the consumers, you then have to build this network. And it really is the backbone. It's like the spine. If without it, uh, you're not going to get anything. So the tra transmission, uh, when we talk about transmission, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of volts. So when we talk about voltage, it's like the pressure. Um, so most of you probably know then what comes out of your outlet, depending what continent you're in, um, is on the scale of hundreds of volts, either 120, 230. So when we're talking about transmission, we're, we're actually talking hundreds of thousands. So you'll hear us talk about it in kilovolts instead. Um, and actually, I think I have some slides that we can talk in more detail on these. But distribution, then, is what you see around your neighborhood. So that's actually the lines that bring it to your house and to your meter. So that's the distribution system. Talk a little bit more about each of these. Uh, so again, I mentioned the generation is the part where you create the electric energy. But I want to focus on, I'm going to skip past this and go to transmission. So this is important because of a thing called power loss. So uh, Ohm's law, the, the most basic law of electric, electrical engineering or electricity is called Ohm's law. V equals IR. It's a relationship between voltage and current. And then that R in there is resistance. So when you add resistance, which is, um, you know, a natural component of, of elements. So again, the, the current is actually the flow of electrons. And they like some materials more than others. So there is a difference between conductor. So those are molecules that, that more easily transfer electrons from one molecule to the next. Uh, and then there's insulators. So they do not transfer the, uh, the electrons from one molecule to the next. So this is important because uh, as the electrons try to move across, there are losses, what we call losses. And ultimately, that comes down to money. So uh, the amount of, of energy that you can transfer from your, your generation to your load uh, depends on your ability to decrease your losses along the way. So you don't want to lose the energy uh, either in a thermal way or a number of other ways. So what we do is we step up the energy, uh, is what we'll call it. We'll step it up to a high voltage. Because as you do that, you decrease your losses. So if you were trying to move electrons around on the system and you're doing it all at a distribution level, like the, what comes out of your outlets, you would have massive losses. So you step it up to a higher voltage to decrease the amount of loss that you have, and then it allows you to move it around more effectively and more efficiently. And then when you get close to the homes, you step it back down to a distribution level. Um, so there's, we call it, there's a sub-transmission level in the middle there, around like 69 kilovolts, 32 kilovolts, but 
Uh, just to give you a sense, transmission is typically 60 kilovolts or higher. Um, you know, in, in the U.S., you know, we typically have up to 500 kilovolts. Um, and then distribution can go down to, you know, all the way down to, again, what comes, what comes out of your wall. Um, maybe a couple things I'll say here as well. So the interstate system for electricity. So um, it really is like the highways of, of the electric grid. Uh, and then the distribution would be like your off-roads or your side roads. So you can get more throughput. Um, so it's important because it allows us to build more clean, renewable um, generation. So it enable us, enables us to meet RPS goals. Uh, it also allows us to, as I mentioned, um, get power to remote areas with lower losses. So grid operation. So this is a this is a map. This is a, uh, a highly simplified map. There are thousands and thousands of transmission lines all over, all over the U.S. Um, and what you see there, there's actually three different interconnections in the U.S. The light green on the on the left there, that's the western interconnection. The red is the eastern interconnection, and the yellow is Texas because Texas always does everything different. So they are, that's ERCOT, that is the Texas section of the grid. So they are uh, relatively uh, islanded from the rest. But as you can see, everything's interconnected. And so that's really important. This regional concept is very important uh, because again, this is where uh, you're able to rely on, as they mentioned earlier, clean energy from other parts of the country. And if you have transmission, then you can bring your wind from up in the north out. You can bring your sunny California power, uh, you know, further inland, you can, you can move this power around more effectively, more efficiently, and um, at a lower cost point. So I just wanted to run through a little example. Um, we were talking about everything's very inter interconnected. So um, when you think about building new clean generation, it's really important to keep top of mind that to do that, you also have to invest in your transmission grid. So I have just a very oversimplified example here that we'll run through. Uh, this is, um, if you look, the, the ones that look like cities, those, are those would be like your load centers. So that's where all the power is trying to get to. Uh, and then you have some plants around the, uh, around the system and some wind down in the south side. So in this scenario, uh, we're going to say that we want to bring in more wind, or there's more wind wanting to be uh, generated in the south. What that does in this situation is that may cause this line here with the red lightning bolt here to what we call overload. And when we talk about overloading in, in the transmission system, it's actually a, a, a component of how much current can flow through that line before the line, um, from a thermal standpoint, may start to sag. And of course, you don't want that from a safety standpoint. You don't want your high voltage conductors to sag into a place where they can hit trees. That causes outages. Obviously, you don't want it low enough to where anybody could touch it and be hurt from a safety standpoint. So it's both a matter of safety and reliability, keeping your, keeping your conductor up off the ground. So you don't want to put more current through that line than what that conductor is rated for. So what you would need to do is you would need to upgrade that line or build a new line or divert the power another way. Um, happy to talk more about that, as that is what my, tech, my company does. But uh, we'll talk more, I think, on that later in the technology section. Um, so you would need to invest, again, in that transmission line there. Another example, then, as you all know, there's a, a number of, in fact, just this week, there was an announcement that the largest coal power plant in the West uh, is going to be shut down, the Navajo plant. So let's take the example here where that, that coal plant in the upper part of the system is shutting down. So what that's likely going to mean is to serve those load centers that was once being supplied by that coal plant, you're probably going to need to bring in more generation from uh, the northeast up there, that, that line in the top right. When you do that, bring in more power there, that could similarly overload that line or put stress on that line. So again, you would need to invest in the system to um, be able to bring in more of that power from elsewhere. And just another example uh, here, we now added another natural gas facility in the top left. Same concept. You may now cause overloads here, and we need to 
uh, invest in those, that infrastructure. So I, I just I wanted to run through this because I think it's important. Uh, it, it's really common, or what I see at least, it's very common for people to talk about uh, you know, the interest in the changing generation mix, but it's not always connected to then the fact that you have to invest in that backbone infrastructure to be able to actually utilize and make the most of that new generation. Um, so quickly, we'll talk about grid operation. Um, so it's a tricky, it's a tricky balance that the gentlemen to my left and, and their counterparts have in balancing generation and load. Uh, I think a lot of people don't realize that at every moment there is somebody out there that is looking at the system, figuring out how much load is going to be required, and then matching that on the generation side. It's a balancing act. They, it's literally called grid balancing. Um, and it's important, because if you don't do that, your, your system will um, move away from the 60 hertz that it's the frequency that it's supposed to be kept at. And when that happens, you could lose major components of your grid. Um, they could malfunction, or if anything you have plugged in, consumer appliances could fry them completely. So it's, it's a delicate balance to make sure that you are, you're keeping uh, the balance between generation load. Uh, so this is the primary task of the grid operators. Um, and so there, there's a number of ways that they do it. So they forecast. Interesting to me when I first entered the industry was that um, I'm sure most of these folks, they have meteorologists and weathermen on staff, people looking at what the weather is going to be for a number of reasons. One, if it's going to be a cold day, then they know that there may be more people turning on their heat, which means that the load is going to be higher. So that means they have to go and schedule their generators uh, or more generators to supply more generation. So again, they can keep that balance. Um, and more and more now, the, the impact of weather is more important as we are now relying on it for the generation resource. So knowing if it's going to be sunny or not, so knowing whether or not you can count on that solar, uh, knowing if it's going to be windy, if you can count on the wind. Wind is obviously a little bit harder to forecast with than, than solar would be, but these are all considerations that the grid operators have to keep in mind. I guess the other thing I would note is uh, similarly consumer behavior. So I, we mentioned the Super Bowl earlier. Big events cause uh, typically more, especially things like big sporting events, um, uh, will cause more people to turn on their TV. Uh, similarly, in, in the UK, a lot of times it means more people turn on tea kettles. So the things that you have to think about when you're trying to do your forecasting, it's becoming harder and harder um, for people to forecast. Therefore, the need for a robust transmission system that allows you flexibility and operational um, convenience is really important. So when you hear smart grid, typically what that's referring to then is a lot of these new devices that are coming on that give more visibility to the operators of what's happening on their system. Uh, and it also, uh, in most cases, means some form of, of indirect control. So the ability for an operator to go turn off a switch or go do something remotely, uh, as opposed to the days of old where you would normally have, you would actually have to send an operator or, or a, a lineman out to flip a switch and take a, a, a breaker or turn a, a line off, essentially. <clears throat> so again, uh, the two-way digital control. And this is, this is newer, so uh, you know, there's still so much room for innovation, uh, which again, it still takes investment though, but room for innovation to be able to make operations smarter, to be able to make the grid smarter. Um, it's, I think another common misconception is that you can just easily control where and how these electrons are moving around the grid but it really is a path of least resistance function. So uh, they are going to take the path of least resistance, whether that's a line that has more capacity on it, whether, that, whether that's a shorter line, so going from A to B versus going from A to C to B. Um, so the, the electrons flow at their, at their will, but there are technologies now then that can allow you to actually control that power and, and move it where you want it, um, which again, just brings more value to the grid. And I'll Please pass some of these. Um, did want to talk a little bit about transmission planning, and I assume that, that again, some of these gentlemen will, will hit on this a little deeper. Um, so transmission planning, it, it takes a long time to do projects in our industry. Uh, it's not uncommon to hear about transmission line projects that took 10, 12 years, 
from the time that they were conceptualized to the time that they went into service. And this is different in any area, depending on the permitting and, and how long that the permitting process takes, if, if it's running through an environmentally sensitive area, um, a number of factors that can go into that. So planning 10, 20 years out is, is common, or at least was common, getting more and more difficult. It's really hard to look out in a 10 and 20 year horizon and be able to say exactly where your generation is going to be because a coal plant could go down in 60 days notice. It's very hard to know where uh, this new you know, wind and solar is going to go, uh, though you could take a guess. And, and similarly, as consumer behaviors are changing, it's really hard to figure out uh, you know, how they're changing, where they're changing. Are, are people going to start going more to rooftop solar or not? Uh, so it just makes it very difficult to plan the grid. So uh, something else just to keep in mind in terms of policy making and, and the way that, that we um, do this planning uh, is important to be able to get these projects across the line and, and to reap the benefits of having the transmission there. And I'll probably breeze past a number of these things. Um, did you want me to come back to technology later or do a quick overview now? Okay. We'll hit on a, a couple things. Uh, so storage, I'm sure everybody hears about storage. Uh, a very cool technology, the ability to uh, you know, take that solar power during the day uh, and store it until you know, mid-evening when peak happens. So when we talk about peak, that is the point of the day where the most load is being basically requested from the consumers. So uh, typically in the evenings uh, when people come home from work and they're turning on their TV, they're turning on their appliances to cook dinner. Uh, so being able to take the solar power from the sunny afternoon, store it, and then use it during that peak is really important. Um, again, though, connecting this storage, you have to have transmission to do that. Uh, Synchrophasers and, and uh, PMUs, I'll, I'll, I'll skip past this, but again, this is really a, a sophisticated monitoring device. We talked about smart grid. Um, so devices that can monitor and provide information back to the grid operators so that they can make um, effective decisions. Uh, conductors. So, uh, Interesting, conductor is obviously the, 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 one of the basic elements of the transmission grid, but even conductors coming a long ways. I mean, there's a lot of new conductor technologies out there, superconductors that can um, you know, help transfer more power with less power loss. We talked about that power loss factor. Um, and low sag, high capacity conductors. Um, so the, the, these are ones that can get more throughput um, without having that sag issue that we talked about. So you can... Um, you can get more power across, more power transferred, before you have to do the investments in, in upgrading those lines. And smart wires, of course, I would be remiss not to put my own technology into the deck. Um, <laughs> of course, these are, so it's power flow control. So what we talked about before, being able to actually direct power from one line to another. So if you have a line that's at capacity, but you have two lines right next to it that are not at capacity, you can effectively tell those electrons to go over to those other lines. Say, hey, go. It's, it's kind of like Waze. I actually, I, I'm not positive that this is how Waze functions for those that aren't familiar with Waze. It's, it's kind of like Google Maps, but um, it's, it's sensing all of its users at any given time. And I'm, I'm confident that at any moment it's telling me to take this, this road over here. Um, well, it's telling me to take that road over there because it's less used, but I actually think in some ways that they're purposely distributing all of us uh, across the roads. Similarly, smart wires is the same thing, just with electrons. So you can actually direct it uh, and control it around your system. So with that, I'll, I'll step back and um, uh, move on to the next person. Happy to answer any questions here at the end. Let's see, who's loaded next? Mari, remember who's up next on the, on the slide deck? I, I think I know. Um, this is Mike Ross. I'm gonna gonna explain something I think that Andy touched on. It's really critical, and that is the regionality of electricity operations. So. Thanks, Jim. Or maybe I should say, Mr. Chairman. As many of you know, he's a former chairman of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and served the United States quite well in that in that role. Um, as Jim mentioned, I had the privilege to spend 12 years in the Congress and member of the House Energy and, and Commerce Committee. I'm now Senior Vice President for Government Affairs at 
Southwest Power Pool, which is one of the seven regional transmission organizations, independent system operators in the U.S., one of nine in North America. And Jim's asked me to just kind of give you an overview of really what an RTO is and what they do and how we fit into the big uh, picture. And so that's what I'm going to attempt to do here in the next 10 to 12 minutes. And I got my timer going, so you won't have to pull me, uh, pull me back. But I also want to thank all the energy-related staffers on Capitol Hill who are here. Uh, having served in the Congress, I can tell you that I know who gets the work done uh, and who makes the members look good. And uh, thank you for, uh, there's a million things you can be doing today, so thank you for spending some time with us here at Wires University as, as we attempt to, uh, to educate folks on, on the grid and the wholesale electric markets and, and what's going on out there. So thank you for your participation and it means a, means a lot to us. So here we go. Uh, I'm going to breeze through a lot of these. These will be available as I understand it on the, on the website. Um, and so bear with me, but I wanted you to have access to these to, to refer back to a little bit later. But uh, so there's seven RTOs. They all basically do similar things. They just do them slightly different from one another, but uh, there's not that much difference. And anyway, so I'm going to speak from an SPP perspective, uh, but, but the other RTOs, ISOs, uh, operate in a very similar manner as us. That's our mission statement, working, helping our members uh, work together to keep the lights on today and in the future. RTO membership is voluntary. Uh, utilities, transmission companies, they find value in belonging to an RTO, uh, and we're proud to, uh, to have them and to work with them, and that's exactly what we do. We work with them. So it, everybody has a different story on, out of the seven RTOs in the U.S. about how they got started. Uh, the way we got started was World War II and the Bottom of Pearl Harbor and President Roosevelt saying we need 50,000 airplanes built, uh, which required a lot of aluminum. And the, the resource for aluminum is bauxite. The greatest deposit at the time was in Arkansas. So the federal government literally constructed this massive aluminum factory in central Arkansas, and they wanted to put it near the bauxite because at the time they actually thought the war might come to America and wanted to be able to have access to the raw material to make the aluminum. Uh, not unlike government today, back 75 years ago, uh, about halfway through the process, they had an uh-oh moment where they realized they needed more power to, to power that aluminum factory than was available for the entire state of Arkansas at the time. Uh, and thus, nine days after the bombing at Pearl Harbor, a Southwest Power Pool was created. Uh, after the war, uh, member companies, the utilities that hadn't worked together in the past, found uh, a lot of value in information sharing, collaboration, and we continued to work together. And after each major event, the government uh, extended more authority, more responsibility to us. Uh, for example, the blackout in 1965, uh, which led to the, the Electric Reliability Act of 67. And that was the founding of NERC, uh, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation. And then in 03, uh, most of you remember that, the blackout in the Northeast, uh, which led to the, and that's what it looked like from space at night. And you can see the Northeast really was blacked out. And that led to the Energy Policy Act of 2005. I was here and on the Energy and Commerce Committee when we did that. One of the things that act did is it gave NERC teeth. And my folks, uh, my colleagues at work remind me all the time that I, actually voted for the bill that allows RTOs to be fined up to a million dollars a day per violation. Uh, so we're heavily regulated. Uh, major services, that's, that's very comparable for all the RTOs, the kind of services they provide. Uh, reliability coordination, market operations, and transmission planning are what I refer to as the, uh, as the big three. Some things we don't do, we do not cite transmission and generation. Uh, we do not construct transmission and generation. We do not do the permitting. Uh, an important distinction to make, that's typically done by your state utility regulators, uh, so forth and, and so on. Uh, that's what an RTO map looks like today. Uh, you can see the seven in the U.S., the two in Canada. Uh, basically, there's a huge gap in the west, and basically where Southwest Power Pool ends is, is where the eastern interconnect ends and the western interconnect begins. And just because of where we're located, basically we, we manage or have responsibility for the, the, what is it, Claire, five or seven DC ties, seven DC ties that connect the east uh, to the west. Um, I can tell you the west is now looking at possible membership in different aspects of the west or looking at RTO membership in California and elsewhere. Uh, what's referred to as the Mountain West Transmission Group uh, recently announced that they're now in negotiations with, with us at Southwest Power Pool. 
uh, which would uh, grow our footprint even more in Montana and Wyoming and Colorado and a little bit of Utah, Arizona, and even more than we have now in New Mexico. Uh, today we're in all or part of 14 states. That kind of blows up the area we're responsible to. MISO has a similar territory, if not larger. Uh, PJM, I think, is a little less larger geographically, but has a, a lot more, a lot more people. Because if you look at if you look at where the wires are in the, in America, the middle of America, um, that's the area that we serve. We're kind of like the Southwest Power Pool is kind of like the electric cooperatives of of, uh, of the RTOs. We represent uh, rural America, as you can see. Um, but a lot of wires there, 60,000 miles of high voltage transmission lines. Um, that would circle, a bit of trivia, that would circle the earth more than twice. Uh, about 5,000 uh, substations, 18 million people, uh, 700 generating plants. Our members, as you can see, if you do the math there, about a third of them are Muni's uh, Public Power, uh, WAPA, which is a federal agency, the Western Area Power Administration is a member. About a third are investor-owned utilities and about a third are electric cooperatives. And we're real proud of our, our member-driven, stakeholder, collaborative process where they all get in the room with varied interest, but they're able to work out their differences to, to make uh, the things that we do for them work. And I'm real proud of, uh, of that. So diversity, basically we say we have independence through uh, diversity of membership. Heavily regulated, as I mentioned before, uh, we're a nonprofit, regulated by FERC, operate on, based on a tariff that's filed with FERC, approved by FERC. Uh, regulated by FERC, audited by FERC, and then for physical and cybersecurity, uh, regulated and audited by, by NERC. Uh, governance, we have an independent board of directors. We have a members committee, a regional state committee, which consists of a utility regulator from each state we serve. And, uh, and other RTOs have similar construct. And so basically when it comes to cost allocation on transmission, it's utility regulators from each state within our region that get together and meet quarterly and work out some of those details. They have sole responsibility for determining cost uh, allocation. A lot of member-driven, stakeholder-driven working groups. Uh, so what do we do? The big three, quickly. Uh, think air traffic controllers. Uh, they don't own the airport or the sky or the runway or the airline, but they direct it all. So we don't own transmission or generation. We simply direct it all. And so literally 60,000 miles of transmission lines, 700 generators, one, don't really know what the other one's doing. We're sending a signal every four seconds on whether they need to increase or decrease generation. We're trying to match uh, load with demand uh, and so forth and so on. That sounds fast once every four seconds, but again, we're talking about the largest machine in the, in the world and it's traveling nearly at the, at the speed of light. Energy capacity, that's the capacity available in our region. It would be different depending on what region you're in. That's the capacity. It's the market that determines what actually gets dispatched. We don't pick the winners and losers. The market does based on uh, the lowest available price. As you can see, coal is still heavy in our region. Wind, though, as you'll see in a minute, is really taking off, and we continue to see more, coal, more gas given that we have $2 gas right now. Some of us can remember when it was $14 gas, though, which would drastically change uh, this, 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 uh, this pie chart. So uh, the market, basically, it's like we have an integrated marketplace. We have a next day market. Today, we were forecasting the demand for tomorrow. Uh, generators were bidding in whatever the lowest price is that clears the amount of load that we think we need to match uh, demand for tomorrow. That's the price they get paid. Uh, it's not only about price. That's important, but it's also about reliability. These markets, whether it's PJM, MISO, us, New England, California, uh, ERCOT, uh, any of the ISO RTOs, it, it's about lowest price, but it's also about reliability. And these markets have been 20 years in the making uh, to ensure both price and reliability. So when someone bids in on the next day market, not only is it affecting and assuring lowest price, but what it's doing is they're made, that unit's making a commitment to us that yes, we will run tomorrow. Uh, then we have a real time market because someone may commit to run, machines break. And so maybe a, maybe a plant's down, Maybe we missed a wind forecast. Uh, for whatever reason, we have a real-time market where we settle every five minutes uh, compared to Wall Street that settles, I guess, once a day. And so that's some of the things that we do as it relates to our market. Uh, our, our new market has been up two and a half years. And we recently announced over a billion dollars in savings to our member companies and their customers, the ratepayers. Uh, so the market is working. It works well, heavily regulated by, by FERC. They recently completed a year-long uh, routine audit of our markets. Uh, and of SPP and uh, no findings, uh, several recommendations which we've gladly accepted and have implemented or in the process of implementing, but again, heavily regulated industry that we're in. 
Uh, transmission planning, Claire's going to talk more about that, so I'm going to skip over, over that aspect of it. And um, I will tell you that we're looking 10 and 20 years out on transmission. Why? Uh, because it takes about eight and a half years from the time you envision a line until it's put uh, in service. That's the generation expansion in SPP over the last decade, as you can see. Most of that is because of wind. Uh, we're wind rich, um, especially the Panhandle of Texas and Oklahoma and Kansas. So uh, people ask me where the wind blows, and I always say where there's not a transmission line. And, and you, so you've got to get the wind from where it, you know, you got to get the power from where it's made uh, to, where it's, to where it's needed. And so trans, if, you like, if you like renewables, then you better love, love transmission. Uh, transmission expansion kind of matches up with the generation expansion you've seen over the last uh, 10 years. And so what have we done? We've, we've directed, uh, what we do is, is our board has to approve and issue what's called a notice to construct uh, for any transmission line to be built in our region. Then whoever's building it takes it to their state regulators and figure out whose backyard it's going through and, and how they're going to recover their costs. But as you can see, we've, we've issued notices to construct for $10 billion. Uh, in the last 11 years or so. Uh, Seven billion of it's now completed, another three billion not in service yet, but either under construction or approved and planned. Uh, who pays for it? I think Clary's gonna get more into that in a little bit, but it, it, it has to do with cost allocation. And again, cost allocation for us, the bigger the line, the more it benefits the entire region, so the entire region pays. Those calculations are determined by those utility regulators I was telling you about that make up our uh, regional state committee. Renewables. In SPP, as you, if you, the purple is where the wind is. As you can see, most of the, the purple in America is almost an exact outline of the SPP region. And so as a result of that, uh, here's where we are, about 16,000 megawatts of in-service wind, uh, 35,000 under development, and the potential for 60 to 90,000 megawatts more. That's in a region that only requires about 50,000 megawatts. So a lot of surplus wind energy uh, in, the, in the future and we all are challenged and must figure out how we get it from where it's made to where it's needed uh, because different RTOs have different renewables available. Some are solar rich, some are wind rich, some just don't have many opportunities for, uh, uh, for renewables. And so that's, it's hard to think about this, but in 2001, when I first got to Congress, SPP was handling 80 megawatts of wind. Uh, 4.30 Sunday morning, we set a new record for North America with over 52% of our total energy generation coming uh, from wind, and I'm proud to report that uh, we were able to, to manage that reliably. Our grid operators five years ago would have told you that would have been impossible. So technology uh, has gone a long way toward allowing us to increase the percentage of renewables along with quick start natural gas, which is absolutely critical. And the technology that brings, some of these 200 megawatt plants now can go from zero to 200 megawatts in under five minutes, which is critical because there's times of the day where you may have 1,000 megawatts of wind. There's times of the day when you may have 12,000 megawatts of wind. That's a huge difference, and, and you've got to be able to manage that so we keep the lights on and avoid brownouts and, and blackouts. Um, so wind units, as you can see, they're concentrated in the middle of the footprint, as I've already discussed. Um, that slide, throw it away because we set a new record at 4.30 a.m. Sunday, and Jim demanded I have these slides to him last Wednesday. And finally, uh, modernizing the grid. And modernizing the grid, we did a study on the value of transmission. The bottom line here is, is transmission facilitates renewables. It facilitates the markets, which reduces fuel cost. So as a result of all that, uh, our study uh, uh, found that for every dollar you invest in transmission, you get a $3.50 return over the life of the transmission line. Transmission is a good investment, and that's why we're here today to talk about it. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll turn it over to Claire Moeller from MISO. So there's three of us with the same presentation. Here's my map, see? Uh, we call ourselves the Coast to Coast RTO, but the coasts are Hudson Bay and the Gulf of Mexico. Um, we do all the same stuff, but what I'd like to talk a little bit about is why. How'd we get here? Um, MISO was formed from whole cloth in 1998 as a reaction to FERC's uh, regulations 
888889, which were a reaction to legislation, which I think was 1995. Two, 92. Took a long time to get to 888, uh, but it was pretty important because the organized markets that we, we started with and that uh, SPP and PJM evolved to were about mitigating market power, right? So I, I was uh, in a utility control room in 1996, and uh, we, we did a test transaction between uh, Minneapolis and uh, Amarillo, Texas, because we were in negotiations about a merger of NSP and um, New Century Energy to become Excel. And so, so we did a test transaction of 50 megawatts. And before the megawatts were flowing, an intervening utility asked for the schedule to be cut for reliability reasons. And before we hung up the phone, that same utility called Amarillo, Texas and said, I hear you need 50, I got 50 for sale. All right, that's a real story. And that's real market power. And that's how we got to 888-889. All right, so that's the why behind the organized market. So equal access, transparent, uh, and, and so that's the trip that uh, FERC has been helping us take to make sure that everybody's treated comparably uh, as we work our way through uh, energy transactions. So my job at MISO is mostly about planning. The, the big difference that RTOs bring from the utilities that we sprang from is the old utility would take their generation to their load and they tried to do that as cheaply as they could. And you did that by minimizing investment because that's just how it worked. Close generation, your load center. The, the difference with the organized markets and the bigger regions is you got a different opportunity. Instead of thinking about minimizing investment, your job is to minimize bills. And sometimes that means you go get cheaper energy from the next door neighbor and bring it to the load. And that was hard for all the utilities to make that transition, right? It's like, well, this is my generation, this is my load, I got them, I'm a monopoly, what do you, you know? So then we talk, well, reliability projects are, you know, for my generation of my load, and economic projects were from somebody else's generation of my load. And, and that was a big change. The notion that you could make a new investment in transmission and make bills go down because you had a more efficient market was a new idea in, uh, in 1998. In, in 2006, my board uh, handed me these uh, six planning principles. What are you trying to do here? The, uh, the old job that we've had since uh, Westinghouse was about reliability. We've got the NERC standards. Uh, we've talked about that a little bit. But the, the new one is make sure the benefits of that effective market can get to all the consumers that you serve. So, so right away, it's about how do you keep bills down? How do you manage the grid so that you keep bills down at the same time providing that same reliability you always had? And then you get some follow-on questions that are pretty interesting uh, because the policy landscape continues to shift. And, and that means what to who, when. Right, so you've got all kinds of advocates that have different ideas of what the right future is. And the planner's job is to figure out how to facilitate the future, however it might develop. So there's a lot of scenario work in that. Uh, $6 gas gets you a very different generation fleet than $2 gas. Well, what's the price of gas going to be? I had a pretty smart gas person tell me once, they said, if you want $8 gas, build like it's going to be $2. And if you want $2 gas, build like it's going to be 8 All right, And that's just the reality. That volatility has been the history, has been the history with gas. Um, how to support the state and federal uh, policies. The, the federal policy is and has been for a long time uh, efficient, transparent, wholesale markets. That is our energy policy. And then let generation compete. States have different opinions. 
everywhere from 35% renewable mandates to no mandate at all, right? And so our job is to facilitate that conglomeration of state energy policy goals and make sure we've got the infrastructure to do what they need to get done. People ask me occasionally, what's the big game changer? What's the Uber in the, uh, in the electric transmission business? I say, well, we're, we're like the roads for Uber, right? It, it's no roads, no Uber, no transmission, no flexibility in our energy policy. So, so that's what we're trying to accomplish. How do you do that? Well, the, the last go around, uh, which I'll spend a little more time on in a couple of slides, the, the, the notion is still, since you don't know the future, you have to bookend the future. So, you know, take a page out of the strategic planner's playbook and go big and go small and take a look at the policies as they've been rendered and see what different strategies might be. So, so what we did was we took three different alternative uh, planning philosophies, if you will, and looked at the regulations that we needed to follow. Those three different philosophies, one was a heavily uh, investments in direct current DC. One was uh, bringing the voltage up to uh, 7,600. And the third one was to use this kind of standard voltage inside our area of 345 kilovolts. And then we did some elementary school math. We literally did the Venn diagram that said what's common to all three of those philosophies. And what we got was $6 billion worth of investment in transmission. That, uh, so, so that process, we started that in 2007 when six governors wrote me a letter that said I wasn't doing very good. Uh, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, we, we approved those. And the last of those 17 projects won't go into service until uh, 2020. Uh, so we're at the front edge of the next set of that kind of planning, trying to figure out what 2030 is going to look like. Uh, lots of turbulence around clean power plan. Everybody wants to know, well, now that it isn't, what are you doing? It's like, well, you know, we didn't believe it. <coughs> 13 of our 15 states were in the lawsuit against the clean power plan when everybody thought it was going to happen. So we weren't counting on it anyway, right? But if you look at the trends, economics wins. In 2005, in our market, 85% of the energy was coal. Last year, 42% of the energy was coal. That's without a clean power plan. That's $2 gas. That's end of life coal plants. That's just the reality of infrastructure. So it's important for planners not to get jumbled up in the prompt politics, you have to look longer than that. And that is actually one of the struggles because the political horizon is uh, two or four years and the planning horizon is 20 or 40 years. And that's, that's an actual thing that, uh, that we all have to remember when we're doing this work. And um, regulation, I talked on that a little bit. It's, uh, not only are the RTOs regulated uh, dominantly by FERC, our members are dominantly regulated by states. And so we get to entertain that uh, regulatory jurisdictional dragon where states and feds both think they should be in charge. Uh, the gas industry is uh, regulated somewhat differently and it's a much more of a federal regulation. And that's a product of how the two industries began. The first pipelines were interstate pipelines. The first utilities were not. They were kind of city by city. So the regulation grew up city by city, state by state on the electric side. And the, the, the long run pipes were kind of the beginning of the gas business. And so FERC has a much larger mandate to uh, to work on the gas side. So this little chart, just to kind of give you the, the idea. So we're a federally regulated thing that comes up with plans that states have to license. 
And so we were, we're always kind of walking on eggs to make sure we don't uh, uh, get into that jurisdictional boundary and uh, cause all kinds of trouble there. Uh, I think that's the same slide that Mike had. That's just making the point that the RTOs are different. Um, California's got its own set of problems, but it'd be kind of nice to only have one state because you know what they want to do, so you can go do it. Uh, when you have 15 states, you can't figure out what they want to do, so you got, it's a lot more work. Um, Texas, they, they checked out. They're not regulated by FERC. They managed to build themselves a fence. Uh, I don't know if that's because they're ranchers down there or how they got away with that, but every once in a while they send us a uh, FERC commissioner. That's always kind of ironic. <laughs> uh, New York uh, does their own thing. So, so again, that's a place where you can kind of figure out what the policy is. But for PJM and for uh, SPP and for MISA, we've got this problem. The states don't all see eye to eye. And so there's a lot of facilitation, a lot of work we do to uh, try to get to a consensus in those places. And uh, that's actually what kind of makes the job fun. So that's the end of my prepared remarks. I look forward to your questions later. Thank you. And our last presenter is Craig Glazer from PGM. All right. Well, Monty Python used to say, now for something completely different. So I'm going to do something completely different. First off, just start with a little bit of a story. Because whenever I talk about this subject, and don't take your time away from me for this, whenever I talk about the subject of the benefits of transmission, I'm reminded of the story of Dr. Alfred Kahn. Anybody remember Alfred Kahn? He was sort of the guru of airline deregulation in the 1970s. But actually, before that, Alfred Kahn was chairman of the New York Public Service Commission. And he would go around the country speaking on the benefits of electric restructuring and the role of transmission. Well, the story goes that everywhere that Alfred Kahn went, he had a trusty driver that went with him. Driver wore a little chauffeur's cap and chauffeur's uniform went everywhere with Alfred Kahn. Well, sure enough, it's about 15 years ago. Jim Hecker is actually having this very same Wires, event, Wires University event. And the featured speaker is Dr. Alfred Kahn. Dr. Kahn, the driver, pull up right here in front of the Russell Senate office building, and he, Kahn turns to the driver and says, are you going to come in and um, hear my speech on the benefits of transmission in an electric restructured environment? The driver gets really annoyed and says, Dr. Kahn, I've heard this speech a thousand times. I've heard this speech so many times I could give this speech. Kahn thinks about it for a minute and says, I got a great idea. Let's go change clothes and you go give the speech. So they do that. They go right here in the restroom, right here in the men's room, and they quickly change clothes, walk into this room right up at the podium. Is there the driver looking very spiffy with a suit and tie? And way in the back of the room where that gentleman is, with a little chauffeur's cap and chauffeur's uniform, is Dr. Alfred Kahn. The driver proceeds to give a speech on the benefits of transmission in an electric restructured environment. The speech is fabulous. He gets a standing ovation. Then it comes time for questions. And sure enough, since we're in the, uh, in here in Congress, Congressman Mike Ross raises a hand and asks the first question as to the impact of ProMod analysis on locational marginal prices given limits on transmission ratings. The driver's taken aback by this question, gathers himself together, and he says, Congressman Ross, that is a really stupid question. In fact, that question is so stupid that even my driver could answer that question. <laughs> well, I hope to be a little bit of driver. Don't take my time away there. I'll be a little bit of driver in the remaining moments that we have. And I really want to, because we're in the halls of Congress here, I want to focus on some policy issues. But before we do that, I got to have a map too. So just a little bit about PJM. We actually are, just like these other organizations, we are the uh, regional transmission organization, actually from a megawatt point of view and population. We are the largest, and we serve here, proudly serve here in Washington, D.C. 165,000 megawatts of load, 171,000 megawatts of generation. 
So we do the same things that uh, Mike and others mentioned, reliability, planning, operations. You've seen that map. But we also, one of the benefits of, of, the, of moving toward RTOs was what I call transparency. And I'll tell you a story about that, because I was chairman of the Ohio Commission. There was a, everybody remembers the California energy crisis and huge spike in prices. But a true story, the, actually the first set of massive price spikes wasn't in California, it was in the Midwest in the mid-1990s. And I remember sitting at my desk and industrial customers calling up, do you know what the price of power is? Do you know what the price of power is? Can you help me out? And there was no place to go. It was a series of phone calls to figure out what were prices of power and what were system conditions. Well, one thing which we've all done is you can go on our website or MISOs or SPPs and actually see in real time the state of the grid. This is actually a picture from our website and there's a little ticker going across on the top like a stock ticker showing the real time price of electricity. That didn't exist back in the 1990s when people were sort of guessing and that in and of itself is a huge benefit. People know what's going on. Quickly, uh, I will mention that prices are really, really low. In fact, we hit, uh, he talked about the greatest amount of wind generation, we hit the lowest prices we've ever hit in the history of PJM just this past week. We are seeing a changing fuel mix. We still got a lot of coal, people say coal's going away. In our region, it's not going away, it's, it's taken a big hit. No question, we've got a lot of natural gas. But there is, the system is quite diverse. People say, well, there's not enough diversity in the system. In fact, the system is diverse. We've got nuclear, we've got coal, we've got renewables, uh, all, all playing in the market. But enough of the statistics, because I really want to wrap up just with some policy questions. We are in the halls of Congress. That's what people do is policy. So let me just raise a couple of issues. And I'm going to illustrate this, imagine. You're the head of the transmission planning department of your local utility, and you just hired these two college kids, really smart, we'll call them Joe and Jane Planner. It's their first day, they come into your office, and they say, we're really anxious to get started planning. So you say, well, let me, you know, just as part of just getting you used to this, I'm gonna tell you what it was like in the old days. When the old days, transmission planning was really easy. What did you do? You built transmission to support major generation projects. You connected generation from, from the generating plant to load. It was one way delivery of power to the home. You didn't worry about what the costs were. You just stuck it in the rate base. It was relatively small. People didn't fight about the return on investment. Those were the easy days. Okay, Joe and, Jan, John, uh, Joe and Jane, now go out and plan. Well, they're kind of smart kids, so they said, well, you know what? I got a couple of questions. They want to ask you a couple of questions before they go out and plan. So Joe Planner raises his hand and says, before I do this, I got a couple of questions because I kind of got to know what, I, what you want me to do and what do you want me to plan? So here's my first question to you, Mr. Uh, my supervisor. Is the grid an enabler or a competitor? You say, what kind of question is that? We're good enabler, competitor. What kind of question is that? Well, and then Joe proceeds, smart kid, he proceeds to say, well, you know what? If the grid is an enabler, I can plan it one way. I accept the grid's a natural monopoly. I use all the tools of regulation and I just build it. I build it and they will come is the kind of attitude. I don't focus on is the generation there, the wind farms may develop, so I'm just gonna build it, okay? Well, grid's an enabler. It enables distant generation to get to customers. But Joe Planner, being a smart kid, says, you know what? Um, there's another model, too. On the other hand, what if the grid's a competitor? You say, grid's a competitor? What does that mean? Well, then, then the grid competes with generation and demand side. We're actually seeing this playing out in New York as a prime example of this. You don't just build it. You decide between demand side management between localized generation and rooftop solar, whether you want to have this grid, which is the most cost effective solution. And Joe says, you got to tell me boss, is it an enabler or a competitor? Cause that affects what the hell I do when I go back to my desk. Say, like, all right, Joe, get out of my office. Grid's an enabler, so go, go. I think you're done. 
Then Jane raises her hand and says, you know what, I got a question too. Okay, Jane, what's your question? Well, what kind of, build, what kind of grid do you want me to build? Do you want me to build a strong grid or a weak grid? I say, Jane, what are you talking about with that? Jane explains, well, if it's a strong grid you want me to build, the generation's distant from load. I just forecast what the future need is, and I just oversize the transmission to what I think is going to be the need. The cost of it, you just spread the cost like peanut butter to everybody, because it's a national asset. It benefits everybody. It's a strong grid, and you decide it's needed because it's needed for the entire region. So Jane says, you want me to build a strong grid? I can do that. But she also says, but wait a minute, you know, there is an alternative out there called a weak grid, or I like to call it a localized grid. Well, what does that grid look like? That's totally different. Generation's closer to load. You're focusing more on rooftop and enter demand side response, energy efficiency. The grid is an enabler of alternative generation. And rather than saying, it's, it's good for the entire region, so just pay for it, no. Is it good for the state? Is it good for the location where it's located? And only those people pay. And we get this, I posit these questions because I would, I would uh, posit to you that one of the problems we have in this country is we've never decided these issues. So poor planners or RTOs, I don't feel sorry for us, but we don't have a public policy decision on do we want a strong grid or a weak grid? Do we want a grid as an enabler, a grid as a competitor? And we have this yin-yang back and forth and back and forth that leads to just endless fighting because we don't have a clear policy on what they want this grid of the future to look like. And that isn't bad enough to, that you can't answer Joe and Jane's very appropriate questions, but there's another problem. It's not even clear who decides these questions. It's not even clear who has the authority to answer these questions, because there's a lot of people in this act. You've got state governors in this act. You've got state energy offices, state commissions. They got their opinions. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission's involved. You've got environmental agency involved. You've got co-ops. It's not even clear who makes a decision of what kind of grid we want. And I would suggest to you that until we get that issue solved, until we figure this out, which is why we're here in the halls of Congress, I think we're going to continue to sort of float around a little bit on this issue. The grid's going to stay reliable. We'll, have, we'll keep the lights on. I'm not worried about that. We will all do our job there. But I think there are some fundamental policy issues. So please come and visit PJM sometime. Uh, that is our control room, which is actually in an underground bunker. If I told you where it was, I'd have to shoot you. But uh, uh, it's actually left over from the Cold War. It's very cool. And I look forward to your questions as well. Thank you very much. <laughs> Come and visit, but we can't tell you where it is. Um, OK. Uh, how about some questions for this distinguished group? Uh, I think you've gotten a pretty good sense of some of the realities we're dealing with that um, we're trying to look down the road a couple of decades as to what kind of electricity system, what kind of a, an electrified economy that we're going to have and try to build towards that or plan towards that. Very difficult job these guys have. Uh, and uh, uh, the planning is, is only slightly less complicated than the engineering. Uh, uh, trying to, um, trying to, to figure out what uh, technology developments are going to occur between now and then. Um, are we going to have a conversion of transportation uh, fleets uh, uh, to electricity and away from fossil energy? Boy, if that happens on a major scale, we're in a different ballgame, aren't we? So uh, uh, it's, a, it's a challenging time. It's a transformative time for the electricity business. and. Um, Almost everybody in the, uh, in the uh, business that I've talked to uh, and in the regulatory side, uh, the, the big word is uncertainty. And uh, that, that means that we need the help and collaboration of people on the Hill, in regulatory agencies, in governor's offices, state regulatory commissions, and so forth. Uh, questions for this distinguished group? 
Um, I think we have some time left, don't we, uh, Carol? Okay. Uh, we've got a microphone over here, if you could please. Uh, we're, we're filming this for uh, 60 minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jimmy Sumba. I'm uh, with the office of Senator Klobuchar. My, uh, as Anne, for example, nicely explained that it's divided in four, in four parts, generation, transmission, distribution, and, and local delivery. I know that the, the talk in general was mainly focused toward transmission, uh, but my question is in general to everyone or whoever wants to take it. It's what are the main threats that you see in any of these four that you, you, you encounter right now? And also, what are the major opportunities that you can see for innovation? And what we can do here in the Senate to help policy-wise to either uh, reduce the threat in either one and also incentivate the, the, the innovations in, in any of those? Thank you. Thank you. Who wants to tackle that one? Then on. Claire? Yeah, so I'll start. Um, the, the, the work that has been going on since, let's see, the first supervisory control and data acquisition computer I put in was in 1979. What we've been doing, adding technology to the grid ever since, has been about trying to maximize the use of the assets that we have. So things like uh, Andy? Andy's company is working on are about how to maximize that value. The RTOs with their redispatch is about maximizing the value. Uh, so those things are important to continue with. The, the energy efficiency is a remarkable tool that um, there's been a bunch of innovation around as well. There is essentially no load growth in the nation. Right, so the notion that you're going to avoid a transmission line with uh, distributed generation is kind of a false premise because the LED bulbs already did that for us. So, so, so the end use side is where there can still be a lot of innovation around that efficiency, and, and I don't think efficiency is ever bad. Uh, and then the last thing is, um, transmission lines move energy from someplace to someplace. So that sourcing that uh, we've talked about, Mike talked about it with the wind, um, solar farms, those kinds of things, the fact that uh, people's choices of where energy comes from is what's driving the need for a more robust transmission system. And so that'd be the third thing, is this quest for less carbon uh, intensive energy isn't going to go away, because that's kind of what people want in terms of what they want to purchase. So we're gonna have to find ways to facilitate and let that option value of transmission, allow people to make the choices as it varies into the future. I'll also uh, jump in. This is um, sort of, frankly, more what I would ask Congress not to do <laughs> than to do. Uh, one is there's a whole lot of discussion about infrastructure. The new president is talking a lot about infrastructure. We're going to see some kind of infrastructure package. I would posit, although I may get people in this, some of the industry people in this room upset, but I, this, is, this industry is funded with private capital. It doesn't need money per se. Money is available in private capital. We just had a meeting earlier this morning, heard from the financial community. They want to invest in this industry. So we don't need to throw taxpayer dollars at this industry. But I think we do need to, transmission is great, but you need to have generation show up to, you know, to, keep the, to generate the electrons to keep them flowing. Each of us operate a competitive market. Congress in 1992 said it wants to see competition in this industry, but every once in a while, um, Congress weighs in trying to skew things, picking one particular technology as a winner and another one as a loser. Um, um, to be honest, uh, the, uh, there's some weird uh, implications as a result of the wind production tax credit and what that does to squeeze out other resources. 
There's now a lot of sort of state bailouts of nuclear plants that's creating its own set of issues. Congress chose the competitive market model in 1992. I think that model actually at the wholesale level has worked really well. When people get in and start favoring one technology or another, I think that really helps to mess things up, to be honest. So this is a plea to, to um, you know, watch it, nurture it, stay with the model that dates back to 1992, and let's not just pick out, well, I like this technology, I like that one, because inevitably we'll get it wrong. We'll throw a lot of customers or taxpayer money at the wrong technology. And the whole idea of why we restructured this industry was to shift the risk to the investors as it should be. They get the reward, they get the risk. That was the whole deal. And I think that deal was paid well for the American consumer. Mike? I would appreciate the question. And, and it's an exciting time to be in the electricity business. Um, uh, technology innovation uh, is totally uh, changing. Uh, the face of uh, of the grid and how we deliver power and and so forth and so on. You know, we as as RTOs, we're looking uh, strictly at generation and transmission and you know distribution and all those kind of things are what we refer to as behind the meter. Uh, but that's changing. You know, behind the meter is changing greatly with a smart grid, distributed generation, demand response, uh, battery storage. You know, Tesla has the deal at the residential level, rooftop solar. And so you ask any of the seven RTOs, and if you look at a graph since 1941, or you can even go back to when electricity was discovered and it started being available to the public, and uh, the chart is almost, you know, it, it kind of goes like this up until about two years ago, and now it's leveling off or actually slightly decreasing. Uh, because of all the things that I mentioned that's happening behind the meter and because of efficiency and my TV went out, the new one gets, it burns less electricity. Same thing happened to my dryer last year. Everything broke last year. Uh, same thing with my dryer, refrigerator went out, yeah. And so, uh, it, it, you know, collectively, that is making a huge difference as well, just the efficiencies that are out there. Uh, and then on, on our side of the meter, you know, in generation and transmission, all the renewables I talked about earlier, uh, AEP, uh, I'll single them out. Uh, they're one of our members, and I'm sure they're a member of several others up here too. Uh, but they have what's called the BOLD initiative, uh, which is, I think, holds a lot of promise. Uh, utilizing exist, you know, there's more and more battles over whose backyard or whose farm a line's going to cross. Uh, the BOLD initiative uh, creates the potential for opportunities to utilize existing right-of-ways uh, to get more power on smaller lines uh, through more capacity and so forth and so on. Uh, and, and so, and the other point I would make is there's a place for all forms of energy. Some people want to favor wind over solar or natural gas over coal, and I understand all that and the debates that occur, but the reason we set a new record in North America and we're able to integrate 52% of our entire energy coming from wind at 4.30 Sunday morning, and by the way, even at that, we were curtailing, curtailing over 1,000 megawatts, 1,000. And, and the way we were able to do that is knowing that we have all these other forms of energy in our basket, if you will. Uh, you've got to, you just, the more types of energy you got, the more you can integrate renewables because until they get this, this storage figured out on a massive scale, and massive scale meaning 50,000, 150,000 megawatts, until we get to that point, you got to always have something to back up because the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. Now, let me add to that a little bit. Um, I, I think that Craig is absolutely right when uh, he talks about uh, uh, letting the market evolve and letting, uh, letting it more or less dictate what kind of generation uh, comes about. Um, uh, on the other hand, I think we can fi assign, uh, find some examples in history where the Congress uh, and uh, regulators that were doing Congress's work uh, have produced some wonderful results in terms of changing the character of the electricity markets. Uh, PURPA, for example, back in 1977, uh, brought about uh, competitive markets, uh, accelerated development of gas turbine technology because there were a lot of non-utility entities that could actually uh, get into the market. Um, uh, there, the uh, and investment tax credits uh, accelerated 
uh, the development of wind technology and brought down the capital costs and ultimately, uh, ultimately make, have made them much more uh, competitive. Uh, there, is a, there is a danger or a hazard there that I think Craig was pointing out in terms of getting too, uh, uh, too involved in, in, in picking winners and losers, but um, Congress doesn't have a half bad record. In 1992, uh, they told my old agency that we needed to look at uh, opening up electric transmission, was a, which was a monopoly, uh, to competition. Let everybody use the wires on an open access, non-discriminatory basis uh, and, uh, and foster markets that were uh, more competitive and therefore capable of driving down the price of energy. Um, uh, FERC did what it was told, and it did, probably did more than even Congress anticipated. And we're in a different world as a, re as a result of that. I know that on the other side of the hill, they're looking at the Federal Power Act um, and whether it has outlived its usefulness. I'd, I kind of doubt that. I'm very, uh, that, that's the kind of thing where uh, I subscribe to Craig's uh, 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 formulation that, that, you know, do no harm. Uh, it's a, they don't make statutes like that anymore. But uh, a lot of it is that uh, regulators and people who work with the industry on an ongoing basis can make some judgments about how that uh, rather elastic statutory mandate can be, uh, can be uh, uh, adapted to, to more modern circumstances. Um, Andy? Yeah, I was, I was going to give my, my thoughts on some of the trends that I've been seeing around the industry. One, and we already mentioned it, but uncertainty. And so then how, how do you operate, how do you plan, build, and operate a grid amongst the amount of uncertainty, you know, the building uncertainty? Uh, and then the other one is consumer participation. So um, unlike ever before, the, the electric customers are, are now actively participating in the industry by putting solar on their rooftop or by plugging in their electric vehicle, by looking at reports of their energy consumption and then making decisions and changing their behaviors based on that. Um, and that's, that's relatively new. So what comes with that, I think, is more demands on their electric providers, more expectations for them. So um, I think more participation, more expectation, and then with that, uh, I think as when consumers become more involved like that, there's there's um, uh, what's the word I want to look for here. Uh, I guess more requirements put in place then to be adaptable, and to you know, anytime consumers start playing more actively in a market, uh, there's just there's more need to be able to be uh, quick about things, have fast solutions, be flexible, be adaptable. Mike, something else? I guess the main point I wanted to make, I forgot to make, and that is that <laughs> that innovation and technology is occurring so rapidly that it's it, it it's almost in, in Congress, and I was part of Congress, it, and Congress does not move very fast. And and so any laws that are, it's not that we need laws as, as much as we need to make sure the laws we have and the laws that are contemplated in the future don't get in the way of innovation and technology that maybe doesn't exist at the time the bill's written, but it exists three months, three years later, so forth and so on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a point I forgot to make. Um, uh, yeah, we have a study. It's uh, right outside the door, done by the Brattle Group, and uh, there may be some copies left out there yet. I would urge you to read it. Uh, they say in a carbon-constrained environment, um, you know, building transmission very proactively in anticipation of what kind of, a, of an electrified economy we're going to have down the road. And starting now, uh, rather than, you know, because these things take eight or ten years to build, as, 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 as Mike said. Um, uh, that's not desirable, but you compare that to gas pipelines, which take three. Um, uh, the... Uh, uh, the, the, the idea that we need to plan in an anticipatory fashion, if we, if the clean power plan goes into effect, probably won't, but if there's a major change in the generation mix from 
fossil energy, or at least from coal to gas and renewables and, and, and nuclear. Um, a robust transmission system, this study finds, will save consumers, American consumers, $50 billion every year. And that is, you know, not pocket change. And, and uh, I, you know, I, I think that's the greatest recommendation uh, I can, I can uh, give you for, for paying close attention to the importance of the grid. Other, uh, other questions? We're, we're talking and not, not listening. Yes, sir. Terry Hill with the Passive House Institute. Pay a lot of attention to what's going on in Europe. And one of the things that I'm picking up on is um, energy efficiency is infrastructure. Uh, is any of that being discussed here? And, and one other question. I'm sort of concerned about the vulnerability of the grid to disruption, solar flares or anything. So what role will distributed generation play in mitigating that? Thanks. So we'll start with uh, solar flares. There's been a lot of engineering done on that. And most of the worries have to do with large transformers. And there are strategies in place to protect those transformers that have been effective. So, so while the solar flare thing gets a lot of press from time to time, it really isn't a very big risk. Um, so the the distributed generation really doesn't play in that, uh, in that horizon. Uh, I wasn't sure I understood your question about efficiency. Could you paraphrase that so I can understand it better? They're talking about having, taking uh, energy efficiency and including under the umbrella of infrastructure. Oh, okay. So, so, so in the states, that tends to be a state by state um, regulatory question, and the 50 states are all over the map in terms of how much they pursue those kinds of strategies. Um, we've you know, seen New York push forward a lot. Some states do nothing. Uh, a lot of states have a regulatory construct they call an integrated resource plan where they cause their uh, utilities to pursue various goals around efficiency. But, but I can think I see the fact that that efficiency has, in fact, flattened load growth to the point where uh, demand is, it's unusual for demand to be the cause of a transmission line. It's not growing load that is causing transmission. It has to do with things like resilience, and things like the, the, the source itself, renewables dominantly, uh, aren't near the load centers. So, so that's what we're seeing in terms of how the business case plays out for a transmission line. Other questions? All right. Hi, um, my name is Maria Blanke. I'm from Climate Advisors, it's a small consulting firm here in DC. My question is for, for Craig, and it has to do on the earlier thread of the conversation in terms of... Um, didn't hear oh, Climate Advisors, oh. We're a very small consulting firm here in DC. Um, this is about uh, government uh, involvement in uh, market, in, in the electricity market, and as you said, in picking technology winners and losers. Um, I'm an economist by training from undergrad and, and graduate school, so I certainly understand the power of the markets uh, to provide an optimal solution and uh, the fact that we don't want to um, introduce distortions of any kind. And, and I also appreciate the thought that, that a government entity can go too far in terms of uh, picking winners and losers in terms of technologies. But on the other hand, and not keeping climate change out of the question, from a local pollution standpoint, from a health and human safety standpoint, um, I think a lot of us can agree that a, in some distant future, an 100% renewable grid would be more desirable than a grid that's based on fossil fuels. And a lot of those things the market can't provide at this point. Um, so what role, in your opinion, does the government have in moving us toward a more 
a grid that's that's more health and human safety friendly, uh, while not creating distortions, uh, not rising costs unnecessarily. But there is, I think, some role for a government. I mean, you you kind of asked the go the ultimate question here, so uh, it's a great question, and it's not an easy answer. Um, one thing, though, is I want to be clear: I'm not suggesting that the grid doesn't respond and the market doesn't respond to environmental laws? Of course it does. And in fact, every day, our dispatchers right now are accommodating environmental limitations on running plant A versus plant B. So if government passes a law that says, I put runtime limitations on coal plants or gas plants in this particular location, we, those are hardwired into the market. I like to consider the market like a, like a food blender. You put the ingredients in and it shakes it all up and spits out the most cost effective and efficient answer given those parameters. The challenge, and it's very much a challenge, is it, this is a how do you do it question, not whether you do it question. And you know, if Congress were to pick technologies as opposed to saying, here's the environmental rule that we want to see abided by. If it, protects, if it chooses technologies, if it chooses particular units, particular generating plants, that's when things get a little bit difficult. But in terms of um, overall environmental characteristics, we are today implementing renewable portfolio standards from a number of our states the Clean Air Act, all that the market responds well to. It's when it you sort of say, I like that plant, but I don't like that plant. I like you, but I don't like you. That's when it gets a little more dicey. And that's frankly an issue that's in the courts right now. And I suspect maybe headed to the US Supreme Court before we're done. Any other comments on that? Okay. Uh, Darren Warner from uh, Senator Angus King's office. Um, what, along those lines, like what can say, uh, the feds do to incentivize, say, collaboration among states that do have these requirements, um, like particularly in New England, you know, where you've got sort of this this call for renewable energy from the state level, but then you've got this growing transmission costs and the costs of the the infrastructure to put that in place to get it from, say, Maine down to Connecticut. So, like, how can the feds help to incentivize uh, collaboration among the states? It's a, well, it's a great question, too. I'll give you one just from a pure, pro, put my, a, a legal hat on, from a pure process point of view. Right now, the only way that states can sort of come together in terms of and not run afoul of challenges to the interstate commerce provisions of the U.S. Constitution is through interstate compacts. Interstate compacts are clunky difficult to achieve. You require legislators and governors to come together. They can take years to develop. And I've been on some that have been very unsuccessful. So from a pure process point of view, there may be ways, and this is a federal constitutional issue, there may be ways to sort of make it a little bit easier for states that are willing to agree to come together and have it legally binding as a, and withstand a challenge under the Interstate Commerce Clause. Um, today, that's really kind of a very clunky process to try to address that. So that's just a pure thing, wholly within this building's authority to address. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so FERC has tried to nudge us all in that direction in their recent Order 1000. The, the whole notion behind regional planning is to encourage that kind of behavior. Um, in, the, in the MISO footprint, we had a situation where the, at the time we were only 12 states. Those 12 states all had renewable energy uh, goals or requirements. And they agreed that, and this, this is where it gets kind of complicated, most of those RPS standards were passed in part because they were local jobs idea programs, but those local programs for jobs did not produce the lowest cost to achieve renewable energy. And so there was a conversation between the governor's offices that essentially came to a political deal that said, 
in your study cite half the wind in the state and half the wind where it's best? And that turned into that $5 billion worth of investment that those states agreed on and the state commissions agreed on how to allocate those costs. So, so there's models out there where it has occurred, but essentially everybody has to get something. And that's usually where they blow up. If you can't find an answer where everybody gets something, you're in trouble. And that's just, that's just you know, that's what I've seen on the ground. Yeah. Unless Congress decides that not everybody needs to get something. And, and that, that, that does occur. I mean, there are those decisions that are made that, that I, I like Craig's remark about interstate compacts, they are a little clunky. But, you know, James Madison put it in Article One of the Constitution for a reason. And, and uh, there are, uh, last I checked, 182 interstate compacts that govern everything from allocations of water in the West to uh, interstate respect for nursing licenses. Uh, and uh, uh, it's it, it, where they exist, uh, states relinquish their regulatory authority usually to some kind of an interstate body, uh, and that is sanctified by uh, uh, the approval of Congress. Uh, and, and, uh, um, and Congress deliberately put that into the uh, Energy Policy Act of 05, uh, and, and, and invited states, gave them a, you know, a go, an, an engraved invitation. Please, set up some interstate compacts to take some of these issues and solve them. The response has been nada. And, uh, uh, and the reason is that, it's, that states uh, have not uh, wanted uh, to relinquish their regulatory authority over uh, utility operations within their state boundaries. Uh, this is a tremendous burden on interstate commerce. And it's really, a, in many ways, the root of why these gentlemen are doing what they're doing. We're trying to solve that problem through other means. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think we've uh, reached the end of, uh, of uh, Carol's patience.